The ambitious plans of Rome's first emperor, Gaius Octavian Augustus, envisaged a program of large-scale conquests to bring the world under the rule of the Roman people. For many years, his commanders waged wars in Spain, Germany, Illyria, the foothills of the Alps and the Danube. In the east, Augustus' objective was the subjugation of Ethiopia and Arabia. Egypt was to be the base for future military operations. A strong garrison was stationed in the country, including three legions, nine auxiliary cohorts and three cavalry. Their numbers were excessive to maintain order in the country and were determined by Augustus' ambitious future plans. In view of Egypt's impregnable geographical position and its special importance for the supply of bread to Rome and Italy, the command of these troops was to fall to a man who enjoyed the absolute confidence of Augustus. The first governor of Egypt was appointed Gaius Cornelius Gallus, a personal friend of the princeps, a poet and philanthropist, who distinguished himself during the last campaign against Antony. Troops under his command, advancing from Cyrenaica, took in the shortest possible time Paradonius, on the western frontier of Egypt, and occupied Alexandria, thus deciding the outcome of the whole war. The appointment as prefect of Egypt was now both a reward for his exploits and a promising prospect for the future. The troops of Cornelius Gallus quelled in only 15 days the riots in the eastern delta and also established order in the Thebaid territory. The cities ravaged by the unrest came under military control and the rebel leaders were captured and subsequently executed. Not satisfied with these results, the ambitious governor continued his march southward. His troops confidently overcame the first rapids of the Nile and, advancing along the river bank, reached the sacred island of Philae. There Cornelius Gallus received an Ethiopian embassy that came to meet him. To the king of Ethiopia, who was not named, he declared him a Roman ally and took him under his patronage. For the border region of Triacontashina, which became a sort of buffer between Ethiopia and Egypt, he appointed, to the displeasure of the Ethiopians, a special ruler. On his return to Alexandria, Cornelius Gaul ordered a monumental inscription of his exploits to be carved on the pyramids of Giza and on the obelisk that now stands in St. Peter's Square in Rome. He also had the whole country filled with statues in his honor. This inordinate vanity, as well as personal interests and other liberties, did him great harm in the eyes of the princeps. But, following the denunciation of one of his friends, Cornelius Gallus was dismissed and summoned to Rome to give explanations before a senatorial commission. Public opinion, fueled by the stories of the fabulous looting committed by the viceroy, was hostile to him. The court condemned him to banishment and confiscation of his property. Abandoned by all, Cornelius Gallus committed suicide in despair. Although Augustus publicly distanced himself from the actions of his prefect, he sanctioned his orders concerning the frontiers of Egypt. Lucius Aelius Gallus, appointed to succeed Cornelius Gallus in office, received unequivocal instructions from Augustus. He was ordered to continue his offensive against Ethiopia and to explore the route to Happy Arabia. Happy Arabia was the name given by the Romans to the Sabaean kingdom in what is now Yemen, in the southwest of the Arabian Peninsula. The S.A. beans traded in incense and spices, both of local origin and imported from the east. By sea, this trade was conducted through the ports on the eastern coast of Egypt, and by land it was carried out mainly by the Nabataean Arabs, who transported the incense in camel caravans across the deserts of the northern Arabian Peninsula. From the Nabataean capital, Petra, caravan routes departed to the ports of the Mediterranean coast, through Damascus to Syria and through southern Mesopotamia to Parthia and Persia. The intermediary trade brought enormous profits to the Nabataeans, and the hope of gaining an important part of these riches was not the least determining factor in Augustus' expansionist plans. The conquest of Happy Arabia, he believed, would bring trade under the direct control of Rome, bring great booty, and enhance Augustus' reputation as conqueror of the world. Alias Gallus newly arrived in Egypt, immediately began preparations for a military expedition. At the suggestion of the Nabataean minister Silius, who acted as advisor and guide to Aelius Gallus in the expedition, a sea route was chosen to advance towards the objective. 
All detachments were assembled at Arsinoe, near present-day Suez, close to the ancient canal connecting the Nile with the Red Sea. Here 80 military ships and 130 transport ships had already been assembled. Avoiding the Sinai Peninsula to the south, on the 15th day of the journey, the army landed at Lefki Kome, near the entrance to the Gulf of Aqaba. The short crossing was very difficult. The troops suffered from scurvy and poor water quality. Several ships were wrecked on the rocks. At Luca Coma, the Roman army had to spend the rest of the summer, autumn and part of the winter. Strabo attributes this delay to the cunning of Silius, who lied to the Romans that there was no land route between Petra and Luca Coma, although in reality there was a busy caravan route between the two. However, from a modern point of view, a sea route for a large army seems preferable to a route through the waterless desert of Hishma. Aelius Gallus set out from Luke Kome and continued through the territory of Hias to the country ruled by a relative of Obad, who bore the royal name Aretas. Strabo complains that water on the way had to be brought in camel caravans, and for food they could only obtain spelt, dried dates and cow's oil. This is undoubtedly the area between Medain Sala and Medina. Aretas offered hospitality to the Roman commander and the army spent a few days in his country to recuperate. Resuming their journey, the Romans crossed the nomadic country of Ararina for 50 days, where they again needed water and provisions. Finally, the army entered the fertile lands of Yemen and approached the city of Negrin, on the border of the kingdom of Sabi. The ruler of the city fled, and the Romans stormed and plundered the city. After another six days' journey they came to a river on the other bank of which a large militia of Arabs had gathered. In the battle that took place here, the Arabs, according to Strabo, completely incapable of using arms, were defeated and suffered enormous losses. Having won a victory, the Romans without a fight have occupied the cities Atlula and Aska and left a garrison here. Having prepared bread and dates for the road, Aelius Gallus approached Merjaba, which he besieged for six days. The inhabitants of the city put up desperate resistance. According to the captives, the Romans were only two days from the land of frankincense, but the army, which had been marching through the deserts for six months and suffering hunger, thirst, disease and heat, had no strength to go on. After failing in his attempt to take the city, the Roman commander decided to return. The Arabs put no obstacles in his way and the retreat took only sixty days. The end point of the route was the village of Igri, in the possessions of Obad, on the seashore. From here the remnants of the army in boats crossed to Mios Hormos in Egypt and in the autumn of the same year by dry road reached Koptos on the banks of the Nile. Strabo, in recounting the hardship of the campaign, is silent on the losses suffered, reporting only that most of the soldiers died of starvation, disease and other disasters. Dion Cassius writes that during the campaign most of the expeditionary corps died from all kinds of hardships. This explains why the Romans withdrew after the first serious failure. According to the official view, the culprit of the defeat was named Silius. Apparently, he originally set out to destroy the Roman army in favor of personal ambition, cruelty and greed. It should be noted, however, that Silius was not called to account and continued to enjoy power until he was beheaded in Rome as a result of King Herod's intrigues. Such a late response suggests that the view expressed was not immediately established. Aelius Gallus, the real culprit in the defeat, also fell from grace and was recalled back to Rome. Unlike his predecessor, however, he retained his good name and became known as an eminent jurist and patron of the arts. His adopted son was Lucius Aelius Sejanus, the all-powerful prefect of the Praetorium of the Emperor Tiberius. Aelius Gallus' successor as prefect of Egypt, Gaius Petronius, had to fight against the Ethiopians. While a large part of the Egyptian army participated in the expedition to Arabia, the Ethiopians invaded the southern limits of the province. They captured Siena, Elephantine and Philae destroyed three cohorts of the garrison of Siena and took many prisoners. What prompted the Ethiopians to attack? As we have seen, Cornelius Gallus took the first step in this story when he intervened in the local conflict and appointed a special ruler of Triacontashina. 
Although Petronius' subsequent retaliatory campaign is presented as a reaction to an unprovoked attack by an aggressor, it can almost certainly be argued that war with the Ethiopians would have taken place anyway. In the much later Acts, Augustus also emphasized that both expeditions, to Arabia and Ethiopia, were undertaken by the respective military commanders on his personal initiative. Petronius launched a campaign against the Ethiopians. The meeting of the two armies took place at the border town of Selchis. Petronius demanded from the Ethiopian ambassadors to return the booty they had captured and to extradite the perpetrators of the attack. Three days were given for the fulfillment of these demands. After the expiration of this period, the Roman commander immediately led his army into battle. Having won, Petronius immediately moved to the nearest city of Ethiopians Premnus and took it by storm. From there he led his army on an accelerated march directly to the capital of the Ethiopians, an important religious center Napata. Although the queen through ambassadors offered him a peace treaty, the return of prisoners and statues captured in Siena, the Roman commander rejected all proposals. The city was taken and destroyed, its inhabitants were captured, and their property went to the soldiers. The son of the queen, who was there, managed to escape at the last moment. Having decided that the Ethiopians have suffered sufficient punishment, and the areas lying further to the south, impassable for the army, Petronius started on his way back. Before retreating, he ordered the ruins of Napata to be razed to the ground. The inhabitants of the conquered lands were levied a tribute to keep them in submission. A garrison was left at Premnus with food supplies for two years. At Alexandria, Petronius sold most of the captives into slavery, and he sent a thousand men to Augustus in Rome. Petronius' actions show that the Romans were not at all going to limit themselves to an act of intimidation, but were seriously planning a long-term occupation of the country. The Ethiopians soon recovered from the defeat. A year or two later their queen gathered new forces, with which she suddenly approached Premnus. The garrison, however, succeeded in making Petronius aware of their situation. The latter, with his entire army, immediately moved southward. For some time the opponents stood against each other, then the Ethiopians sent ambassadors. Petronius sent their delegation to Augustus, who was at that time on the island of Samos. Having received the Ethiopian embassy and listened to their requests, the emperor showed mercy and not only granted the Ethiopians peace, but also released them from paying the tribute imposed on them. The reason that made him change his mind was the changes in the balance of power in the East, where at that time a war with the Parthians was brewing, as well as the strengthening of opposition among the Roman nobility.